Hello guys, today we'll talk about the respiratory system. So first up, let's start with the anatomical division and then we should move on to the histological one. So in the beginning we have the upper respiratory tract and then the lower respiratory tract. The point is that the upper one contains the sinuses, nasal, fat, nasal cavity, pharynx. And uh, the lower one contains the larynx, trachea, bronchi, and gen then generally the whole portion of the lung itself. So histologically speaking, we have two portions, the conducting and the respiratory portion. What is the difference? Well, the conducting portion has to has one function, one main function, of course. It is to debris, to clear, of course, the, the air that passes through, to moisten the air, and of course, to get rid of anti of bacteria, of any sort of pathogens, any sort of debris, any sort of foreign particles, of course. We'll see how exactly uh, this is done by the conducting portion. And then move to the respiratory portion. The function, of course, is clear respiration, which means the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen uh, from the human body and the environment, the atmosphere, and so on. So we'll see exactly how these things are done in just a bit. So uh, when it comes to the bronchi itself, we should discuss a bit more about the bronchi because we'll find two classifications again, anatomical and histological. Anatomically speaking, we have the primary bronchi, the right and left, secondary, tertiary, and then the smaller uh, branches and branching outs of the uh, bronchi. Now, why do we need this anatomical classification? This is, this is mostly uh, due to the function, due to the logic and the rationale that we have different function, different units of uh, bronchial units, which of course make easier uh, surgeries and complete removal of, of, of separate parts and units of the bronchi, of the bronchioles, of the bronchi, sorry, of the smaller bronchi, and allow, of course, the uh, complete function of the rest. This is a more of a surgical, you'll see it later on uh, in uh, other courses in your future. So this is the point of the anatomical structure, generally speaking. Now, when it comes to the histological point of, uh, point of view, we'll discuss the differences between the uh, subclassifications of the bronchioles in just a bit, when we see, of course, uh, the differences between the conducting and the uh, respiratory portion in a bit, in the classification of the histological point. So uh, we should discuss a bit about the major epithelium that we'll find here, one very unique epithelium, which is the respiratory epithelium. Now this epithelium is, uh, is called, of course, this way because it covers up the most uh, upper respiratory tract pathway and along as well, of course, with the uh, uh, small pieces and small parts of the, um, of the lower tract. But let's first discuss what it is and then we'll see exactly where we find it and what exactly uh, its role is. So the most uh, numerous uh, epithelium inside the respiratory epithelium is the ciliated columnar cell, which is a pseudostratif pseudostratified epithelium. We already mentioned what it is, the pseudostratified. Of course, it means that there's only one true layer of cells, but because we have many different heights of the epithelia in this case, we'll see it, it, it would appear that it's stratified even though it's not. So this one line of cells, what does it contain? There are two subcategories of cells in here. The ciliated columnar itself, of course, which is the tall cell that its function is to uh, move debris, to move mucus. We'll see how this mucus is produced. So, uh, of course, the cilia, or so-called kinocilia, have one major function in this case, which is to move and to uh, beat in a specific motion in order to clear out debris or mucus or pathogens or whatever it finds. So the question is, where does this mucus come from? Well, of course, from the goblet cells themselves. So the goblet cell has one function, which is to produce mucins. In, in fact, these dome, -shaped, these pyramidally shaped cells have the nucleus in the basal part of the cell, and after some time, uh, and continuously, not sorry, and continuously produces mucins, granule, mucin granule, mucus granules, that of course are being exocytosed, and after exocytosis, you have the expansion of these granules and practically the size grows multiple times itself the volume is multiplied uh, and uh, by exp by this expansion and the the consequences that we control and we have this mucus surface that covers and entraps of course all the uh, anti the pathogens generally or, or foreign particles and as a consequence it controls both the uh, bacterial uh, balance and uh, maintains a relatively uh, a safe environment for the rest of the epithelia. So uh, this is the basal, the basic function of the goblet cells. Now we already know, we've seen already many times the basal cells and I already told you that in most of the times, 99.9% .9 any cell that is short and it's a basal, a basal cube, small cuboidal cells in the close to the basal membrane typically and always have the typical function of the uh, mitosis, of the regeneration and these are the stem cells of course of the uh, conciliated columnar cells. So in case of an injury of any sort of pathology and there is some sort of destruction or uh, let's say defect 
of the columnar cell after it scores its degradation, its death, then the, the basal cell will mitotically divide to produce, di mitotically divide and differentiate in order to produce and to uh, substitute the missing columnar cell in this case. Uh, then we have the two smaller subcategories, which we shouldn't care this so much about, but just namely we have the brush cells. The brush cells are chemoreceptive cells, and the small granule cells, which are cells that are part of the diffuse neuroendocrine system, or also called DNES. We already made a mention of DNES in the uh, digestive system. So let's start seeing exactly what, how does the mucus move and how does the mucus entrap? As I told you before, this expansion, uh, with this expansion of the mucus, of the mucus uh, particles, from the, the membrane, from the outer mucosa layer, we have this uh, sticky, practically sticky layer that entraps any sort of pathogens. And after, of course, this entrapment of pathogens or foreign particles, we have this continual beating of the cilia, or of course, given by the columnar cells. And uh, as a consequence, we have the movement of mucus and entrapped, of course, uh, with the many different foreign particles or pathogens, and their continual beating upwards towards either the mouth, which then you expect right, cough out practically, or you swallow in this case, and this is the future, let's say, the, the whole potential of the mucus. It's either to, and to entrap and expectorate or to swallow uh, and then pass on, sorry. Uh, so in this case, uh, we should continue and see exactly how this membrane looks like. And I want to make a special mention here. Of course, if we can see, typically this is the mucous membrane, the mucus, uh, the whole mucous membrane. Beneath, we're going to find the numerous columnar cells and this small basal cells, which are typically better seen in this picture right here. We'll see them, of course, in a bit in the uh, slides. But the, what I wanted to mention here is this very, very thick layer, this very thick layer exactly beneath the basal cells and beneath the columnar cells. And this is exactly the uh, this is where we can find the thickest basal membrane in the whole body. In fact, because of its size here, this is where it was discovered. Uh, exactly in the respiratory portion of the pseudostratified epithelium or also called mostly and more properly called respiratory epithelium. So the first thing we should do, the first uh, sp uh, slide we're going to talk about is the epiglottis. So the epiglottis is a unique slide because it contains, uh, let's say, very uh, direct information and direct hints to the uh, student or the, the, uh, the examiner of exactly where we are and why we are at it. We'll see exactly in just a second why and how this is done. So here we have the epiglottis. And the unique feature here is that we're gonna find the two different epithelia, uh, different types of epithelia exactly in the same slide. The first two ones we're gonna see is the stratified squamous nucleus and epithelium. And as we said many, many times, whenever we have the squamous stratified nucleus epithelium, this means one thing, that this is a wet area, which means because this is because, of course, there is no point of water loss or water or liquid loss. Uh, and, and of course, in comparison to keratins, which is uh, the point of the keratin is to maintain hydration and to maintain the liquids and the, the content, liquid content within the human body and not outside, for example, the skin. So let's go back to this nocotinized epithelium. The point here is that this is a wet area. This is the first hint you should have in order to identify the slide of epiglottis. The second one you're going to see the biggest, then the second epithelium you're going to see exactly in the border beneath is the pseudostratified epithelium or the typical, typically called uh, the uh, respiratory epithelium exactly right here. And one very, very important feature is the junction point, the point that it changes from the mucous membrane, the, strat the stratified squamous nucleus epithelium to the uh, pseudostratified. Here exactly we can see a very nice portion, of course, again, the uh, typical morphology of the uh, of the of the nonkeratinized epithelium, and exactly on our right, we're going to find the the ciliated uh, cells, of course, in the top, and the basal cells exactly in the bottom, the typical cuboidal, uh, let's say, basal cells. So this is the the very the first hint that we are in a respiratory portion that also uh, overlaps with the wet area. So we're exactly in exactly in this portion that we have both wet area and uh, we have we're part of the respiratory system. So this is the first give out. Uh, uh, of the uh, that here we have the epiglottis. This is the first one. The second one you'll see, of course, is the cartilage. As you can see exactly right here, and we already mentioned that uh, this cartilage, with along with the perichondrium, can be two different options: either the hyaline cartilage or the elastic cartilage. So, in order to identify and to distinguish uh, the hyaline cartilage between the elastic and hyaline cartilage, we have a couple of tricks up our sleeves. 
the first trick that we can have is of course the content in the lacuna if we find uh, up to two cells up to two chondrocytes within the lacuna then we can be almost certain that we are in the elastic if we find more more than two up to eight then we can say that this is the hyaline cartilage now of course this is only a theoretical point and practically speaking it's not that all it's not always that easy to distinguish uh, if the one lacuna that we have in front of us is exactly in the same layer because let's not forget we're working in a three-dimensional structure so you might have overlaps you might have visual tricks you might have typical illusions of course as always as we always have in the uh, case of the uh, slides in the two-dimensional slide of a 3d structure so the second and most is the easiest trick to identify of course if you don't have a different staining because as we know the elastic cartilage contains high amount of elastic fibers and this can be stained with a Verhoff stain for example this is the picture of the Verhoff stain and we can see the differences in the content of the elastic so you can see all this black all these black points all these black uh, stained areas are of course filled with elastic fibers so if you don't have a second staining and the, typically you want you'll have typically the typical H and E then the other give out is of course the epithelium so as long as you see one cartilage structure either hyaline or elastic and these two different types of epithelia then you can be sure that of course the respiratory and the non keratinized then you can be sure that this is the epiglottis and as a consequence you have the elastic area and the function of the epiglottis so I'm sure you already know from anatomy I'm just going to state it out again is of course to block out the larynx and to block out the food from going into the larynx and the trachea and of course prevent suffocation so this structure has to be elastic has to be able to uh, practically uh, let's say flop and cover and overlap the full structure of the pharynx and then go back in order to uh, allow breathing in this case so this is the uh, very very easy way to identify the epiglottis along with these structures along with the cartilage and along with the two different, two different types of epithelia you're going to find of course the serum mucus glands now uh, it's already it's very fairly fairly easy to identify the mucus glands because of their empty like shape and of course the difference is with the serum mucus the serous is is that we have the uh, very very intense basophilic colors so in these pictures we can actually see both this is a very very typical serous gland and this is the very nice uh, let's say lucid looking mucus gland in this case so uh, the structure, of course, is the epithelium as always, then epithelium, then the basal membrane, then again we're going to find the lamina propria, the common thing that we're going to find is here is the, uh, first the loose connective tissue, then the dense irregular connective tissue, uh, beneath, of course, the, the, the glands, and then we start with the cartilage itself. So uh, this is pretty much what you're going to see in this case. And of course, let's not forget to see and to identify these few sparse adipocytes present here, along with the capillary right here in this area. So let's move on. Now, our next slide is going to be the trachea. What is the difference, histologically speaking, with the trachea and the epiglottis? Well, of course, is the, uh, the point. First of all, let's start with the function, and then we'll see exactly why it is different histologically. The point of the trachea is to what? Is to cover and complete and sustain a completely open diameter, not completely, constantly open diameter, in order, for, of course, for air to go in and out. But there is a trick here. Because the trachea is anterior to the esophagus, and of course food passes through the esophagus, distending the esophagus, the trachea has to be a structure that contains both rigid elements in order to maintain a diameter, constant one, uh, constantly uh, somehow either open fully or somewhat closed. So we have, we have this necessity, this functional necessity uh, for the trachea to adjust its diameter constantly. So uh, in order to maintain this rigidity and to maintain this uh, let's say uh, uh, the rigid part of the structure would be the cartilage of course not elastic in this case We need a hyaline cartilage something that is more rigid and more sustainable and more mechanically responsible Let's call it so here. We have these two sections. We have the uh, cross section and the longitudinal section right here uh, Of course as we can see either from all also from the uh, picture of the anatomy of the human body uh, we can see that the picture of the trachea is just circles concentric circles of cartilage along the whole axis of the trachea so if we set if you cut this this section and visualize in the microscope we're going to see exactly these two uh, pictures so we can see this is in this case in order to to understand exactly how this diameter can be partly closed and partly open and partly restricted and partly uh, partly open dilated we're going to see the both elements so of course anteriorly placed we're going to find the rings of the hyaline cartilage and 
uh, in the posterior area, we're going to find other elements that are soft tissue elements. So in this case, we're going to find in, within the back part, we're going to find the trachealis muscle. Now, the trachealis muscle is, of course, a smooth muscle. And we're going to visualize it exactly in the microscope in just a bit. So in order to really understand and to really, uh, let's say, comprehend the idea of why uh, the trachea has to have a different volume, complete diameter, once for fully open, once partly closed. We can see this this very nice imaging technique that allows us to see uh, the uh, changes in the diameter of the trachea. So this is exactly where the water goes in, and the trachea, as uh, as you can see, uh, undergoes two differences. Of course, there's the compression of the uh, mass from the esophagus to push out the trachea, the whole uh, larynx and trachea. So this is one function. And the second, of course, is that the back part of the trachea has to be soft in order to allow for this distension to take place. So histologically speaking, we're going to see uh, in the back of the trachea, the trachealis muscle. So first up, we have, as always, the Epithelium, when this case is going to be the respiratory epithelium, the pseudostratified epithelium with cilia, goblet cells, brush cells, and the uh, sorry, the brush cells, yes, and the small granule cells. Now, of course, as always, we, we can easily identify this, this structure because of the, uh, the, let's say, the ciliated structures on the top of the epithelium. Of course, exactly beneath, as always, we're going to find the subepithelial loose connective tissue, or also called lamina propria. Beneath, we're going to find the connective tissue. And here we find, as we can easily identify by the very, very nice contracted appearance of the nuclei, as we can see perfectly here exactly in this section, this is the very, very typical picture and the very typical appearance of the smooth muscles. So this smooth muscles, as you can see, is functioning as a whole pretty much. And uh, this is called the trachealis muscle. In the bottom, of course, exactly uh, posterior to it, we're going to find the ceramucous glands again, as typical and as always of course covered and encircled by the very very uh, nicely stained here dense connective tissue so this is the structure generally speaking of course and lastly we have the adventitia the tunica adventitia which is a mixture of many different types of uh, let's say of adipose tissue of, co of capillaries of uh, fibrocytes and so on and so on and to uh, understand exactly the differences between the hyaline and this is the hyaline cartilage and the hyaline and the elastic we can see first off uh, numerous uh, coexisting uh, chondrocytes within one lacuna, more than two. For example, let's see in this picture, this is exactly three in the same lacuna. This is a very clear picture, or even here, even better, four. And as always, is covered by the perichondrium there, two layers of the perichondrium. So, as you can see, it's quite easy to understand which structure is the epiglottis and which is the trachea. Of course, the easy giveaway is the two different types of epithelia and the epiglottis. We have again the non-catatinized and respiratory portion in the respiratory epithelium. In this case, you can see that you can find only the respiratory uh, portion, respiratory epithelium, and of course, no presence of uh, trachealis muscle. As you can see, the very, very big and very, uh, let's say, uh, prominent uh, smooth muscles in the whole area of the pore, the back portion of the trachea. Of course, the logic is exactly the same with the longitudinal section. We're going to find exactly the same features, but we're not going to find easily or at all actually the, um, uh, the smooth muscles, the trachealis muscle in the longitudinal section because we're going to have the whole, uh, the whole portion of the, uh, or the whole portion of the smooth muscle, the posterior part of the trachea. So let's move on to the lung.